Joining me now is Mary Erdos, uh, CEO of JP Morgan Asset and Wealth Management. Also, I'd like to welcome Jim, Jim Zelter, co-president of Apollo Global Management. Guys, thanks so much uh, for being here today. It's great to chat with you. Um, just, Mary, just to touch on equities based on that conversation of volatility, I just wanted to get your take on sort of where the equity market is, you know, is risk appropriately priced in that asset? Oh, it looks like we're dealing with her connection. Okay, so hang on one second, Mary. We're gonna fix your connection in just a second. So Jim, actually, I'll just piggyback to you. Uh, in credit, um, where is risk priced in the credit market? Well, good afternoon, Alex. And, uh, you know, certainly we've been, on, we've, on, we've been on a tremendous roller coaster ride uh, the last three or four months. But when you just look at a couple of basic barometers uh, where leverage loan and high yield spreads have been over the last, you know, 30 years or so, They've averaged right now, both US and, and global high yield loans and bonds are in this 650 area spreads. And uh, that's a little bit wider than the historical numbers, which would be in the mid fives, which I do think reflect, uh, you know, a bit of risk in the environment considering where we've been um, and the and the reacceleration of the of the consumer um, and whether we are we are in really a V-shaped recovery. Uh, an extended U or an L, which I know a lot of your panelists uh, during the day and Bloomberg have talked about today. So, you know, certainly we're, we're off the bottom in terms of credit um, and we've, we've rallied quite a bit. But um, I think, again, if you look back at the historical numbers, we're a little bit wider than the historical indexes would, would tell one. And if you think about the relative risks that are confronted right now in the overall economy, that's not surprising. So, Jim, what letter shape recovery then do you think uh, we'll see versus what you think is priced into, say, the credit market? Well, I think what you're really seeing in the last 30 days is the market saying that it's much more sophisticated than a V or U or L. And the reality is there's going to be a variety of companies in any one of those areas. Um, some companies that were very much focused on, you know, um, you know, retail, the day-to-day -day retail. As states open up, people are coming back, and those companies are going to show a bit of a V recovery. I would, on the extreme, uh, whether it's business travel, high-end travel, or business travel, I think that's going to be a much more extended, uh, you know, L-shaped recovery, along with a variety of, you know, consumer and behavioral changes. So, you know, I don't think I think we were all trying to use blunt tools. Uh, in the middle or the beginning of March um, in terms of appraising what type of risk. Uh, and I will tell you at Apollo, in terms of our overall platform, um, you know, certainly we're probably on the more uh, conservative view on when the aggregate demand comes back, which has an impact on unemployment and consumer spending. But certainly there are companies that are showing uh, a V-like tendencies, but I don't think we're seeing that for the aggregate marketplace overall. So. It's really much. It's, it's very. It's very much an idiosyncratic bag, and I would say it's much more of a, a classic stock pickers market right now in credit, in terms of understanding the dynamics of those two situations. All right, Jim. We are joined by Mary. Mary, I'm glad our connection got restored here with you. So I, I don't know if you heard, but I was asking Jim about where risk is priced in the credit market and what kind of recovery is being priced in versus what he may see. So I just wanted to get your perspective specifically uh, on the equity market, and then we can kind of move on from there, Mary. Sure. Apologies. Hope this works a little bit better. Um, I just want everybody um, to know that I'm so thankful you're doing this and that we're all getting back to conversations that are normal. And this one's uh, live here from the branch. So we're, we're thrilled with that being here. Our branches, by the way, have been open, uh, most of them for the entire time. So. Um, People are still working really hard across the country to try and get this uh, back to normal. And we are, uh, we are also working hard to make sure that clients are right-sized in the markets. And your question about the equity markets is the hardest one for everyone to answer. Um, it seems surprisingly high, uh, but we have never had this much stimulus in this short a period of time with interest rates at near zero levels. So when you put $6 trillion into the US markets alone, 11 trillion around the outside uh, rest of the world, you have markets that are reacting to that. And if you look back at 2008 and 2009, and you say to yourself, I wish I had put money to work in, 2000, in March of 2009 after 
um, the government stimulus had finally gotten itself to work its to start to work its way through the system, you would have had a very nice and long um, ride in the market. So here we have it happening within a short couple of weeks for the stimulus to be announced, and then within a three month time period, the market has snapped back. So I think clients are um, trying to figure out: is this that the markets are pricing in advance of where we're going to be over the long term, or whether they're off sides? And I would just you know, reiterate what others have said on the call uh, earlier during your program, which is, you know, markets are not emotional, investors are. Markets don't actually care about deaths, wars, uh, tragedies, different um, racial issues that are happening in our country, uh, all this sort of uncertainty of vaccines and pandemics and the like. Markets care about bottom line earnings and they see through the short term into the medium and the long term and the markets are telling us that the world will come back, that the U.S. in particular, and that the S&P 500 is a representative of very large and uh, successful companies in the U.S., the majority of, of them, without digging into the comments that Jim was talking about, winners and losers, is really the most important thing that we'll do. So the markets have been taken up to levels that are reflecting just that, looking through to the medium and long term. And now the question is, if you've been in cash and you've been one of those people that have added to the trillion dollars of new money that have gone into short-term money market funds over the last three months which with which by the way it took us three months to add a trillion dollars to these short-term money market funds it took us uh, a year to do it during the great financial crisis so there's a lot of cash on the sidelines in addition to the government uh, stimulus that's available and we're gonna we're gonna have to digest that as the markets feel you know like they're trying to price that all in. So, Jim, then to your world, when you're mentioning like winners and losers, uh, and there is so much cash on the sidelines, why are you being cautious? Is that because the Fed in there, so it's going to extend the time until we get to that distress cycle? Like, what's the thesis behind that, Jim? Well, I think I think the cre credit is is uh, Mary and I both know. Uh, having been around for a few cycles, credit really is the lifeblood of the economy. And it all starts with credit, and that's why the Fed and Treasury were so diligent and give them great credit for what they did. They were they, they had a playbook. They had the Great Financial uh, Crisis Playbook of 08 and 09, and they, they executed uh, wonderfully on that. You know, I, I, I do think that there are, we've been talking about the three phases of investment opportunity across credit. Um, and I'll tell you from the from the Apollo playbook, we've talked about the three the three the three periods being really the first is market dislocation, which we clearly saw for three four weeks in March. Uh, then the second stage is a stage of you know capital solutions where companies uh, all across the board need debt and equity solutions to tide them over three months six months eighteen months depending on the industry and the capital structure. And then the last phase is the distress stage, distress stage, excuse me. And now those three stages, which we've all seen over the last 12 months, last 12 weeks, we've participated in all three of them to different degrees. You know, we put, we've been on offense since day one. We've been very fortunate. Uh, year to day, we put about 50 billion to work. Um, and at first it was that dislocation, those three weeks, which it was an amazing period for investment grade debt, you know, great high yield and uh, leverage loan companies that had just been uh, taken out to the woodshed, if you would. Um, and then there's been a variety of capital solutions, uh, whether it's Expedia or Albertsons or many other transactions that we collectively led. So, you know, I think also this distressed angle, uh, you know, I, I would just throw a little bit of wind of caution. I think I agree with Mary in terms of extraordinary uh, you know, global monetary and fiscal response, you know, 14, 15% of global GDP, you know, unprecedented numbers. But that being said, um, and while we certainly are off the trough in terms of an economic recovery and we're back, businesses are opening, you know, getting back from that, that par level January 1 or in March, uh, we trough at like 35 to 40% of activity getting back to par is going to take some time and there's going to be some companies mm -hmm. um, and some industries and some locations that are just going to be more challenging just because of consumer behavior. But, you know, it's been an extraordinary time. And, and again, yeah. the ability we're, Mary and I are both fortunate. We, we oversee big platforms that, that touch and, and see many things, but that's the Apollo perspective. 
Uh, so we do have a question from an audience member uh, joining us, Akash from Singapore, asking, Mary, this is for you. Um, with $11 trillion injected by central banks, when do you expect the impact of the liquidity injected by the central banks to start to wane? It's hard to even ask that question because you can't imagine a time where all of a sudden you're going to pair back on a Kiwi or a corporate bond buying program, Mary. Yeah, well, we're nowhere near that. And, um, and there's plenty of liquidity right now to fill the hole. As Jim was talking about, first you have to fill the hole. Then you've got to get the flywheel of the economy going. And then you worry about the winners and losers after that. And it's very important that this, the, the amount of liquidity, there's been 505 central bank initiatives that have been announced just in the past one year alone, including things like this morning with the UK VAT tax and the like. So that's just the money that's already been announced. And there's plenty of time to go should things get worse. So I'm not worried about the stimulus. I'm worried about what stimulus does to bad companies that look like walking zombies. And that's really where Jim and Apollo are the ones that shine them so well in this environment. I remember post the great financial crisis, and it's hard to think back that when you went through 08 and 09, it was all a blur. And you think, if you think back, you think, well, 09 was the bottom. So 09, uh, March of 09 would have been the time that you would buy distressed. And in fact, that's not at all the case. Uh, we invested a lot of money with Apollo and the majority of that wasn't put to work until the beginning of 2010, as you went into 2011, 2012, because you have to be very patient with what stimulus does and then the after effects of finally sorting through the winners and the losers. So I think this cycle of distress, you have to be, you have to have the liquidity, you have to be ready to seize the moment when it happens. And that's why so much of this money that has been put in cash and on the sidelines is being allocated to the experts in the distressed field. Um, and they're ready to do that. And there have been opportunities as we've seen over the past several months all across different sectors, particularly in real estate and the like, where there's hung deals and other situations. But it's going to take a long time. And you want to be there and you want to have patient capital that isn't required to follow an index and have to be invested at all times. Well, and Jim, um, if I'm not mistaken, you guys have deployed about $50 billion uh, during the crisis so far. So can you sort of thread the needle there between where you've been putting that money and then what Mary was talking about until we just don't know how it's going to shake out? Sure, uh, you know, a, a vast majority has it, you know, in terms of uh, the Apollo deployment on offense, it really has been in credit. Now, um, we touch credit a lot of ways. We touch it in our insurance companies by being very active players in the investment grade market, which we were quite active uh, in March and April as the wives, the, you know, this is an asset class that was 100 over treasuries in January. It widened out to 350 over in March, really historic wides. And so we were quite active in offense on that. Uh, we were quite active on offense and in the, in the what I'd call the, the mainstream loan and high yield markets. There were a variety of companies that, whether it's a satellite company or a communications company, that obviously were affected by the macro, but weren't affected by the, the specifics of the, of the environment. And we were quite active in that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a variety of vehicles that that uh, applied capital to great American companies like Expedia, like Albertsons that were at different points, one Expedia, an investment grade company that had a variety of withdrawals because of, of client withdrawals on travel. You had an Albertsons that, that the, uh, a great American company that, that the sponsors wanted to take public and really wanted to have a financing in place ahead of that. Um, and so those were all credit. We obviously have taken some toehold investments in distressed across the platform, but as Mary said, um, you know, this is about patience and my suspicion, our suspicion is throughout 20 and into 21, as the company country grapples with, you know, some degree of unemployment, uh, a variety of consumer and behavioral changes and certain industries that just take a longer period of time to get going, there will be those opportunities, but um, you know, again, it's 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 about breadth of platform and being patient. And again, I think what you know um, what's different about today than 08. 08 was really about the residential problems, and really uh, our banking system was having their issues. Today, banking system is as strong as ever. Fortress-like balance sheets, 
Uh, and the real issues are in commercial real estate and really a lot of these consumer behavior and, and entertainment, travel, and lodging. And so, you know, a lot needs to be, the consumer is a big part of our economy, 70% plus. So how those remnants and second, third derivatives will really have the trajectory for the next 12 to 24 months. Mary, you're nodding. Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, this, the, 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 the good companies from the bad companies is one of the most important things that we will all figure out. By the way, we should just add, it's also going to be the good municipalities and the bad municipalities, right? There's a bunch of stimulus that's also coming for local governments, and that will be good for the bad states. And um, it will also be good for the good states, but they won't have needed it, and, uh, and they won't have been rewarded uh, for having run their shops so efficiently. So there's a lot we're gonna to have to think about as, as we put that money to work. And I, I just think it's ever more important for people to think long-term, make sure they've got the right asset allocation in mind and make sure that they're not offsides in anything. The, the, the problem with any market environment like this that has the volatility that it's seen is that the, the gains don't feel as good as the losses feel bad and it causes all sorts of emotional moves up and down. Jim Chanos was talking about all of the people that have gone into day trading uh, and some of the online trading firms. I think that causes all sorts of complications for people. It is not a market you want to be trading like that in. You want professionals to think through the long term. And if you look, no one is having the conversation about a active managers and can they make, you know, more money for clients rather than index like strategies today, because this is exactly why you need active management. You need active management in the public markets and you certainly need active management in the private markets. And that's what you're seeing, which is that we're continuing to do the long term bottoms up fundamental research of does, is it a good company? Does it have good cash flows? And I'm, and I'm discounting those back at a near 0% rate. So all of that is starting to look better. And that's what's being reflected in these markets. Hey, Alex, Jim, I, I quick, have a question for Mary. Sorry, you, know, you know, so Mary, you, you really have a, an unparalleled platform to which to see and, and understand what's going on in investors' minds. And in addition to the, um, the hoarding of cash or the savings of cash, what else would you see different in terms of your client base uh, today, what questions are they asking you versus 08, 09, or any other cycles? We've, we've both seen a few ourselves, but again, your, your perch is really unmatched out there. So I think the audience would love to hear about that. I would say that I have been most surprised by the lack of panic. So the scenario that you go through in any crisis is first, there's a flight to quality, which is normally short-term money market funds. In the last great financial crisis, that was what we spent a lot of time talking about because that wasn't a solid footing in order to put money in until we shored up new regulations. This time it's fine. It's been, a, it's been very safe and secure. Then people start moving out the credit spectrum. They go into short-term bond funds. They go into high yield funds. We've seen more inflows into high yield ETFs year to date than we have in the past 13 years together. So there's just a lot of money. And by the way, it's coming from the short-term markets going up the credit curve. It's also coming from people in the equity markets wanting to not necessarily know where to navigate. So they're using the high yield markets to do that. So it's becoming a very crowded market, but people are not panicked. The margin calls uh, that happen, they happen in a very short window. We were running at about a thousand a day. People had wherewithal to be able to cure them pretty quickly. Now you're seeing that in corporate financing, very smart companies knew exactly what to do. They had the playbook from the great financial crisis. They didn't necessarily draw down on lines unnecessarily. They figured out how to get their financing in shape and they've ridden through this. So I, I feel like we're in a very calm period. People are looking to put money into less liquid assets where they don't need to look at them on a daily mark to market basis. They can think about those for the long portfolios. That's in the sovereign wealth funds. That's in the wealthier individuals around the world. And they're ready and have enough liquidity that should we see something else, and that something else may not come from anything anybody's looking at today. It may not come from COVID. It may not come from racial tensions. It may not come from China trade war issues. It may come from something totally different, but the market is fragile, and just that little something may cause a wobble that people are not ready for unless we have continue to have the stimulus that provides that cushion. And so the smarter money is really ready to take advantage of that. That's why Jim is seeing so many inflows uh, into Apollo. That's why we're seeing so many inflows across our alternatives platform 
of people saying, I got it. I want to have my money there. And then I want the professionals to be able to take advantage of it. And I'm not showing signs of panic. Uh, great. Great insight, you guys. We have about a minute left, and um, I'm working from home. I'm assuming Jim is too, but Mary, you're clearly in the office, as you mentioned. So I wanted to get perspective on like, are people coming back? Are you at a, like, when do you get to 100%? What's the work from home like? Walk, tell me about it. Well, at JPMorgan Chase, we have a quarter of a million people around the world that we quickly got uh, to a work from home scenario. So thankfully, all the investments we had made in technology over the years made that quite simple. Uh, and smooth. And so we had close to um, well, over 90% of the entire global population was it a work from home scenario. Certainly different places around the world are going to return faster. Our Hong Kong hit a high of 39% on Friday of occupancy. They are ready for this. They have already lived through SARS. They know how to, they know how to uh, prepare themselves. Masks are a normal part of, of daily life in uh, in most public transportation and the like. So that seems to be working. Europe uh, starts to open a little, uh, uh, some pieces have been open. Some of our offices have been open all the way through in terms of trading desks and the like, but we have Milan, Spain, Geneva, um, Paris, other places opening up next Monday and then the following Monday. And then the US uh, where we've always had the branches functioning so that people can continue uh, to manage their daily lives and small businesses and the like. Um, they are starting to open more of the ones that were just drive through only. Uh, they are starting to have the more fulsome team in. And the most important thing for JP Morgan Chase is that it is safe and secure, that people don't feel stressed about it. Reentry for anybody that's been out of the workforce in any kind of a leave, a medical leave, a maternity leave, reentry is a very stressful time period. We have to work through it slowly. It's going to be different in different places, depending on how you transport yourself into the office and out of the office. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take that step by step. We're going to phase in and we're going to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. But people crave interaction with other people. And while Zoom is a fabulous technology for each of us to be able to do these things, Zoom is not spontaneous. And when you need that support from a colleague and you're trying to do very difficult lending decisions, M&A transactions and the like, it's just the, to the extent you can have some of it in person. And I think life will change a lot for a lot of the way people work, but you still need some of that. And so I think that's what we'll all be working through. And you'll see corporate America adjust accordingly. And I think we'll be in a better place for it. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to leave it there. Um, I can't wait to work not in my living room. Um, it was a real pleasure speaking to both of you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jim Zelter and Mary Erdos. Thanks very much. I appreciate that.